Isabel, hello. 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 I've, I've seen you face to face, I think, a year ago. Yeah. So it's good to see you on this square as I... It's so lovely to see you. Yeah, and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so I guess without further ado, uh, I'll just start with some silly questions and then we can, uh, we can go on and, and start talking about the serious business. So um, just um, quick questions, answer quickly, just the okay. choice between two things. Okay, don't, don't think about it too much. So uh, what, would you, what would you prefer, robots or cyborgs? Ooh. Mm -hmm. uh, cyborgs. Cyborgs. Yeah. Star Trek or Star Wars? This is an important one. Uh, Star Trek. A very good answer. Mm. Favorite Asimov novel? Um, oh, I don't have one. I love them all. That's true. They're all so good. <laughs> what about a favorite AI movie? Mm, favorite? Well, currently, I think it's still 2001 Space Odyssey. Yeah, that's I think a good anything, one. I don't think anything beats that, to be honest. Okay. You're an expert on AI. So what, what's the most accurate depiction of an AI in a movie? Ooh, what's the most accurate of, of one now? Um, yeah. mm -hmm. I think that uh, there isn't one that really depicts anything that we actually have in reality at the moment. Okay. Um, so I would have to say, um, I don't know, come back to me on that one. That's a hard okay. question. We'll, I didn't expect we'll that one. We'll come back. We'll come back. Last one. What's the scariest depiction of an AI in a movie? Hmm. The scariest depiction of an AI in a movie. You know, I think Black Mirror has some of the scariest oh, depictions um, because they really um, enter into the psychological terror of not being able to control your own mind and thoughts. And I think that's the most scary aspect that I've seen personally um, depicted. Absolutely. Scarier than Arnold Schwarzenegger, I think, uh, in, in its yeah. depth, at least. Most uh, things are scarier yeah. than Arnold Schwarzenegger, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. I'm, I'm sorry for these silly questions. I'm just uh, uh, very excited about sci-fi and artificial no, it's cool. intelligence myself. So, yeah, we got to know you a little bit. Um, now I'm going to ask you a question that you're probably used to being asked. Mm. And we can start our discussion here. By the way, um, everybody that's here... Really nice to have you here. I, I really appreciate uh, those of you that uh, opened the video so we can see you and we feel that there are actual people here and not artificial bots uh, watching us. There will be a time to ask questions. We'll have a discussion right now about 45, 50 minutes and then we'll have about half an hour for uh, asking questions. So be, please prepare your questions uh, for Isabel and we'll, we'll get there uh, very soon, closer to nine. So first question uh, that I have for you, and again, this is a question you usually ask someone uh, engaging with a specific topic. Uh, what got you to start engaging with the notion of artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. and specifically from a psychoanalytic perspective? Yes, uh, that's a big question and a, and a long one, so I'll try and be succinct. I mean, when I started my um, doctoral research, I was particularly interested in, in general, in the question of technology in relation to human subjectivity and coming from a, a sort of um, philosophical background, uh, I became more interested in the psychoanalytic um, dimension to the questions that I wanted to ask. And at first I was sort of more um, coming from, I say, a sort of speculative realist and new materialist perspectives that were quite quite fashionable um, uh, in in the kind of sort of accelerationist um, tradition, and you know the Deleuze Guattarian uh, approach to thinking about um, subjectivity and the body, and these seem to be the um, discourses that were most engaged with the questions of technology and the questions, the new challenges that were, to me, the most exciting um, things to get my head around in relation to artificial intelligence. Um, but I kind of, 
there was in in this literature that I was reading, there was there was sort of often something that I I didn't feel was quite hitting the mark for me. Um, it didn't really get to the interesting nuggets that I was becoming more intrigued by through uh, reading psychoanalysis, um, reading Lacan, and, and being um, in, immersed in psychoanalysis. So it became clear to me that there was sort of a missed encounter between the psychoanalytic literature and the psychoanalytic conceptual field and the question of um, the technological um, imbrication um, of the human body and of the human mind. And it was th th this intersection that I then sort of gradually came about this idea of thinking about the psychoanalysis of artificial intelligence and how those two uh, fields would intersect with each other. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it, it was a very, it sort of, it's a, it, it became a, it was a very broad question at first. And I had to find a way of, of kind of knitting the two together in a coherent um, way that had a particular uh, thread to it that didn't just try to mash too many things together because of course they're like enormous fields that you could get totally lost in um so that's yeah so that's how it it began yeah absolutely i i had the pleasure of reading your manuscript uh, for your upcoming book uh was fascinating Thank you. absolutely fascinating i enjoyed your work and it got me uh, thinking on many many things uh, which are extremely interesting. You've mentioned uh, Lacan. So do you mean Jacques Lacan? Um, I do. How did you get uh, to working on that kind of uh, specific psychoanalytic uh, school? Mm. Well, I mean, for me, I, I wouldn't really consider any other school than um, Lacan. So sorry if people are going to um, throw me off the chat now. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean that 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 to me was the most rigorous, the most interesting, mm -hmm. the most conceptually rich and um, provocative mm -hmm. toolbox that um, enabled me to uh, think about both questions of um, the nature of subjectivity and and most fundamentally the question of sex and sexuality, which is uh, central to my um, to my thesis. And so, you know, for, for, for Lacan, obviously following Freud, the question of sex is completely um, fundamental to his thinking. And it is not just a, a sort of superficial question of um, humans engaging in, an, uh, in sexual acts, but, but sex is an ontological, epistemological question that frames the very entrance into subjectivity for speaking beings. So therefore, the way in which he went about using the concept of sex to me was essential to mm. the way that I think about artificial intelligence as well in the book. Mm. I see. Yeah, we'll get there. Absolutely. I have some interesting questions about that part of your book. Uh, but maybe I can ask you something more general uh, mm. at the beginning. Um, well, artificial intelligence is definitely uh, more than uh, a science. It's more a science today than a fiction, let's mm -hmm. say. And uh, in, on the other hand, in your work, uh, I saw that you engage with so many cinematic and literary representations of AI in mm. science fiction. And I've counted a few, and I'm sure there are more, like uh, 2001 Space Odyssey, the movie Her, Ex Machina, iRobot, Ghost in a Shell, Westworld, and also Blade Runner, uh, of course. Uh, that uh, also some of your work on Blade Runner has just been published in an essay collection as well. Mm -hmm. Now, many times in the past, we've seen that psychoanalysis has been used to interpret uh, cultural products, uh, such as jo those I just mentioned. But instead of interpreting these movie and psychoanalytic terms, uh, what do you think psychoanalysis can learn from the fiction that engages with the notion of AI? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think that that's also very central to the way that I try and use psychoanalysis in, in this um, book and in the whole way that I approach psychoanalysis generally as a toolbox, um, which is that I think that um, psychoanalysis, obviously as a clinical practice, has a specific um, goal and a specific remit 
but of course it's more than that it's also a um uh as you say a, a sort of way of to, to interpret culture but also it's a it's a it's a philosophical practice and of course we could get into the question of what the difference between philosophy and psychoanalysis is which is also part of the book but um but i i i just want to say that with um the question of lacanian psychoanalysis I think what's really interesting is the way that it allows you to have um, great elasticity elasticity with concepts and to be able to apply um, concepts beyond the question of the human subject, beyond the sort of sometimes the, the, the way that people think of like, psychoanalysis as being sort of conservative practice for um, bourgeois subjects who want to complain about their lives. But on the contrary, it's something very radical and it's something subversive that allows us to think beyond the human body and beyond uh, our, our societal restrictions. So I think that what with the question of film and with representations of um, certainly sci-fi and representations of artificial intelligence allow us to, to see not just, oh, how do we interpret this in a psychoanalytic point of view, but what can that, how can that help us to see what what psychoanalysis can do um, differently? Mm. How do we uh, change the concepts? You know, get inside them and move them around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's extremely important. I think when engaging with culture, not only interpreting but also learning something about our praxis as as psychoanalysts. Yeah. Well, maybe I can ask you another general question. Mm. Um, in, uh, let's say, in, in philosophy, there's a term called uh, philosophical zombie. Uh, it's, again, ap apropos talking about films, it's, it's something uh, that sort of some philosophers try to understand what a zombie is. And, you know, in films, they're portrayed in many ways. They're sometimes green, they're sometimes fast, they're sometimes slow. I prefer them when they're slow. And it's, it's, a, it's a question, what is a zombie? And the notion of philosophical zombie is uh, is defined as as someone, a human usually that uh, looks like us, uh, behaves like us, has the same body, the same brain, the same neurons. Everything is exactly the same. This person goes to university, goes to sleep, has a family, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The thing that distinguishes a philosophical zombie from a sentient human or a human being is that a philosophical zombie does not experience uh, the world from a subjective perspective, from its subjective first of, point of view. There's a term in philosophy called qualia, as this thing that is the subjective experience of existence of the world. Now, what I want to ask you, because it's called artificial intelligence, but what I want to ask you is, do you think that the term intelligence is the right one to describe whatever factor determines uh, sentient life uh, in general, or whatever can be called human or human mm -hmm. psyche? Um, yeah, excellent question, because um, the, 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 the first part of the book is really um, concerned with um, the question of intelligence, the conceptual question of intelligence, and how um, it's a it's a very loaded term, and it's one that it itself has a sort of genealogy and a, a history of how we now come to understand the concept of intelligence, because of course it has changed over the years, and it's one that is influenced greatly by um, different scientific paradigms as well as political paradigms, and this concept of intelligence as we use it today. Um, can't so easily just be lumped together with the question of artificial intelligence without already entailing a huge um, number of preconceptions, prejudices, um, philosophical assumptions about what intelligence means. Mm -hmm. So with that said, you know, there's one aspect of, of, of my interest is, is looking at the, the question of intelligence and, and, and trying to unpack what it means, but also um just um bringing to the fore the lacanian conceit which is that already um this idea of intelligence the intelligence subject is one that is problematized by the very 
uh, nature of psychoanalysis itself in the sense of the concept of the split subject, i.e. there is no such thing as just this holistic, intelligent thinking thing that is there. Rather, there is a, a gap between uh, the subject and the subject of speech. And in between this gap, there is all of these other ways that we try and understand what intelligence means. But before you can even get to the question of intelligence, you're talking about a, a body who's in, in language, who then has to communicate, who then has to um, formulate symbolic structures in order to navigate themselves in the world. And, and this is, psycho, for psychoanalysis, it's a completely different way of trying to approach the question of intelligence than, uh, say, for perhaps your average philosopher of, of artificial intelligence who, who would approach the, the question of consciousness in a completely different way. Okay. So, i.e., the unconscious, you know, this, this question of the unconscious already problematizes the transparent nature of intelligence. Yeah, absolutely. We see that already in Freud, even in the interpretation of dreams, where he says that there's a different rationale to these levels uh, operating in dream formation, and later what we call the distinction between consciousness and the unconscious, and uh, also in the later model uh, of the ego, it and superego. Mm -hmm. How do these uh, come to be in your perspective or in your picture of a an artificial intelligence psyche? Mm. Well, they they kind of, um, first of all, I suppose I, I'm interested in, in kind of like building up steps to, to unpack how to even talk about an artificial intelligence because I don't really think of it as one thing. Mm -hmm. And I try to like, um, take various measures in order to to delineate exactly what I'm talking about when I when I talk about artificial intelligence. So, for example, the the first step I take is to uh, try and, as I say, talk about the question of intelligence itself. Then the second step was is to to think about the question of the subject in relation to the object, because for psychoanalysis, it's not just a question of a subject; it's a question of an object, and these two things are fundamental into understanding uh, how human beings. Um, communicate, how they desire, how they enjoy. Um, so this question of the object uh, is fundamental in the way that I think about artificial intelligence as mm -hmm. something which may be an object or, or have an object. And then lastly, um, this leads me to the question of sex and the question of uh, what Lacan would call the sexual non-rapport, which is a sort of quite technical term that we don't necessarily have to get into here, but um, the question of sex and the sort of fundamental question of enjoyment, which forms the pivotal concept of the of the book, mm -hmm. the question of jouissance. Once I've done all those things, I get to this conceptual idea of the sex bot. Um, mm -hmm. And then from there, there are various ways in which I envisage the sex bot, which is um, takes various different iterations via the human body. So we can say there's three different iterations of it in the book. The first is the exterior, outside the human body. The second is the interior, uh, inside the human body. And the third is the extimate, which is both interior and exterior. Uh, so yeah, there, there's a sort of gradual progression of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the artificial intelligence as it moves outside and then through the, the human body as we know it. Yes. Yes, I've I've read the manuscript, uh, and that it, it's 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 a very interesting perspective, I think, to uh, engage with the subject of AI uh, through the question of sex and the question of the sex robot specifically. Mm. Um, so let me ask you: How do we begin asking the question of sex when thinking about AI, and how does it project on? the psychoanalytic understanding of sexuality. So maybe you can really provide us with some introduction to, to your thought on this. Well, um, first of all, I suppose we should talk about the psychoanalytic notion of sex, um, mm -hmm. which fundamentally, unlike, unlike many um, discourses on, on what, what sex is about. For psychoanalysis, it's, it's quite different from how um, it's often thought about. I mean, it's first of all, it's not just, we're not talking about biology most of the time. And second of all, we're also not talking about um, harmony either. Mm -hmm. 
So neither are we talking about some kind of mystical idea of a masculine and a feminine uh, creature being um, attracted to each other and or um, there being, and then of course, then you have homosexuality, which would be a different version of it. It's, it's, in psychoanalysis, it's a completely different approach because for psychoanalysis, it's to do with modes of enjoyment. It's not to do with what type of body you have, it's to do with the, the mode in which you enjoy and each of us enjoys in a different way. And therefore there are multiple ways of um, finding enjoyment in another human being, as we know. Um, but fundamentally the question for, for psychoanalysis is not one of um, opposites, it's one of um, disjunction. Uh, it's one of incompleteness. So uh, each, each human subject is um, a subject of speech, which is a subject who is inherently lacking in something, but we all lack in a slightly different way. We all, we all, we all um, pursue a slightly different um, object, and this this kind of inherent uh, sort of incompleteness is is the the the, the sort of sine qua non of, of subjectivity. So, starting from that from that point, um, we have a slightly different understanding of what the subject is. It's not a full subject. There's never a full, complete human. That's a full man or a full woman. That that doesn't exist for psychoanalysis. Um, so, from that basis, uh, it it became quite interesting to me to try and think about how 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 artificial intelligence um, is sort of parasitic upon a quite um, unrefined uh, notion of of human sexuality and particularly in, in, in science fiction, you see that um, so much of um, our, quite our thoughts about artificial intelligence are, uh, are about fantasy, you know, of course they're about fantasy, cinema is about fantasy. But um, instead, of, instead of thinking that, of that as a sort of drawback of like, oh, well, you know, films always portray women in a certain way, or it's always gonna be exploitative about, you know, women's bodies. I thought there was something much more interesting to do with the question of structure, because in psychoanalysis, we talk about structure of subjectivity. We uh, talk about the way that humans experience the world because of the stru this, their in, in, um, psychic structure. So this question of structure and the question of sex is something which um, is very interesting to uh, think about when you're watching science fiction, because it's, it's uh, a very, um, immediate way of being able to try and appraise the different modes of enjoyment that are being represented by, via these different forms of artificial intelligence. Um, so yeah, that's... Can you give us an example from your book, one of the uh, uh, portrayals that mm. you engage with and maybe share with us some insights that you unravel when you engage with it? Yeah, so there's, very, there's so many uh, different... Um, aspects of it and I mean so most of the most obvious uh, kind of trope that we that we see um, in science fiction is the idea of the um, artificially intelligent um, fembot or sexbot woman who is uh, brought into existence by a man who's created this perfect image of femininity and of course in that in the film Ex Machina there is this um, portrayal of the Turing test, which is the famous test by which um, Alan, Alan Turing designed, by which you can, uh, uh, by which you're able to discern um, whether or not a uh, artificial intelligence is human yes. via the, by the questions that, that, that you ask them and their responses. And interestingly, in the original test, um, the actual, the way that, that it was designed was that um, you were having to dis you were having to tell whether from the responses that you were receiving the linguistics responses they weren't voiced they were typed uh, whether or not it was a male or a female so that the the question of gender was already um, sewn into this to this experiment but it wasn't really noticed at the time that this was significant um, even though Alan Turing killed himself um, because he was sort of so persecuted for being gay himself yes. so it was is in itself a very sort of tragic and um, horrible irony. So the question of gender and the question of knowing somebody's mind 
is a very um it's a very uncanny and to use the, a freudian term uh it's a very uncanny thing because in this film where um a young computer scientist is trying to discern whether or not uh, this female robot is really thinks really feels it's you enter into this very psychoanalytic um dialectic between the male obsessive um neurotic character and this very feminine classic hysteric of uh you know who am i tell me who i am um, am I a woman? You know, what, am I human? And and the, and the man is sort of wanting to pursue this um, object of his affections, mm. and you know, it's a sort of quite classic sort of romantic um, masculine fantasy. But actually, underneath it, there's a very interesting uh, pursuit going on um, to do with the question of the other's knowledge, and to do with the question of uh, how do we ever know what who somebody is? Because mm. of course. You know, knowing what some trying to understand somebody's um, inner thoughts, this 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 fantasy of of really knowing what somebody thinks is an impossibility. We can never do it. All we can ever do is enter into um, a sort of discursive um, arrangement with somebody where we're trying to f figure, we're trying to fill the hole that we you know that is in them, and we're trying to get them to fill the hole that is in us, and and via this way we. Uh, we form a relationship and the way in which without going into all Lacanian technicalities, the way in which this particular relationship was portrayed was a very perfect a sort of um, instantiation of a sort of hysteric woman and a neurotic obsessional male couplet. But it also was sort of emblematic of the question of the other's mind, the question of consciousness, trying to know whether the other exists. Um, so that's the kind of first, to me, that was the first way that I tried to get into the question of um, of AI. And because I go by it, sort of, uh, via the Kantian, the classic philosophical Kantian questions, what can I know, what should I do, and what can I hope for? This first way that I go into it is, is by the question of what can I know, which is the sort of classic epistemological um, concern of philosophy which I try to um, subvert slightly by using the sort of Lacanian toolbox. And, uh, you know, Joan Kopjek famously uses Kant's um, antinomies to read the, the graphs of sexuation. And therefore you can see by, by just looking at this, this, this um, film, how you can sort of apply the, the Kopjek's um, use of the Kantian antinomies to to think about the, the sexual non rapport in in this relationship. So that's one of the first ways I do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a fascinating movie. I agree. Yeah. Mm. So let's continue on this topic. Um, it's interesting because you you engage with the question of of sex from so many perspectives uh, in in the manuscript. Um, now. Something that's um, sort of a fact of, of human existence is the, is the idea that um, sexual copulation, or the principle of sexual copulation, is rooted in the fact that the organism necessarily faces death. And one aspect of AI is the fantasy that life can be copied into an indestructible digital existence. And now, without death, sex is not the same. This is a psychoanalytic fact. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what I wonder is, what kind of human sexuality do you think awaits us in this transition between reproduction and moving on to replication? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a really fascinating question. And uh, I won't say I, I answer it, because that would be very... Um, hubristic um but i try and think about it in the the book and and i find it a, a real sort of psychoanalytic conundrum actually because um you know thinking about origins thinking about um what in psychoanalysis we would call the primal scene you know this this fantasy of trying to uh imagine your um birth or be, be there when you entered the world 
Um, this is one of the sort of inherent uh, impasses of, of, of psychoanalysis. This, you know, this is Freud, you know, was really getting at this when he was first thinking about all these questions. It's not, you didn't have to wait for Lacan. Freud was already um, right on the mark. You know, he he was saying, well, you know, this there's these impossible questions of um, human existence that we can't know, we can't answer. And this is what philosophy always sort of tries to paper over, but but for psychoanalysis, these inherent impasses are the things which actually um, are the root of culture. This is where culture comes from because all the different cultures are, are different ways of trying to paper over these impossible um, gaps in knowledge that we can't really understand. Where did we come from? What is sex? You know, um, what are men? What are women? You know, how do we, how does a, how does a human body create another human body when it's just a piece of flesh and then suddenly there's a, a human mind in it and then it's another person, you know, these are questions that actually, they're not amenable to science. Um, and yes. psychoanalysis knows that. And, and that's why, you know, psychoanalysis has a very interesting and complex relationship to science because it really sits at this intersection between trying to understand rigorously the workings of the human mind and the human speaking subject, but at the same time, knowing that it can't actually answer these very technical questions that science tries to answer uh, because they're, they're just not questions that have an answer. Um, so, you know, this really, this really hits at the, the, the heart of the question of reproduction because um, with, with, the fantasy of, of, of AI at the moment, um, you know, people like Ray Kurzweil, for example, who writes massive tomes about the singularity and how to create a mind and all these books that look, you know, wow, how, how, how are you gonna, how are you gonna give us the answer to this? And actually I was flicking through one of them today, um, uh, one of Ray Kurzweil's books, The Singularity is Coming, I think it's called something like that. Mm. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's that fat. And I thought, okay, let, let's see, you know, how many, how many pages are dedicated to sex? And there is like three mentions of it. Um, and where, they, where he does mention it, he says um, something like, oh, you know, sex has often been con connected to reproduction, but actually uh, in lots of cultures, we, we don't necessarily have sex to reproduce. And you're like, really? Did you do, is that, is that the extent of your thinking about, about what sex is? So, you know, that aside, like, it's like, well, these are the people who are thinking about artificial intelligence in and who are working in it and who have huge amounts of power and influence, yet they don't really think about this enormous conceptual terrain that is the human being, you know, the sexual speaking subject. Um, so when you when you talk, when you think about, well, okay, let's imagine the, the time where we can just reproduce. Um, non-biologically and and in as of Blade Runner you know uh just create um replicants that can then create other replicants that don't have childhoods etc etc um and and you immediately are in this kind of strange no man's land where you're like well what what would that be what what do we have to what sort of questions do we have to think about then and and that's why that film Blade Runner is is very interesting because supposedly it's um so you know subversive, radical, futuristic, actually it's completely conservative. It's, it's, it's about mm -hmm. the family, it's about, it's very Oedipal, it's very, it's about reproductive futurism, it's about the idea of finding yourself as a child and trying to project your future and, and it's all about the relationship between the man and all these different female characters that he has circling around him. So, you know, I, I don't know what, what it would be to have a um, to be able to reproduce, um, replicate humans. We, we don't know, but what we do know is that we're completely still unable to think about it without psychoanalysis and without recourse to the tools of psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. Yes, you mentioned this, this movie, um, which again, there are two. Uh, I, I always prefer the first one. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's one of my favorite uh, movies, sci-fi movies. Um, the thing is that both uh, this film, this, the reproduction, and um, also the movie Her that you also mm -hmm. engage with uh, in your book, it's a bit more vanilla, I think, but still, uh, 
sort of poses the, the a question about the intersection uh, between human sexual gratification and AI. Right? And this is, again, we're still in the domain of sex and you know, some psychoanalysts uh, argue today that we are already in the time of a fu the future of sex, uh, where pornography diverted uh, our sexuality from a state of uh, the Queen Victoria, from the Victorian prohibition, uh, to a mode of uh, incitation, intrusion, provocation, and even forcing of pornography. And the, th this is indeed true all in the realm of pornography, but also we see how uh, pornographic, uh, uh, the pornographic uh, industry and the industry of sexual gratification, sex toys, etc., is merging with the virtual. So we see mm -hmm. a sort of a merging between sexuality and the virtual. In this sense, what, what do you think this merge between AI and human sexual gratification, and this is again the question of the sex bond, mm. what kind of future does, it, does these new configuration of sexuality and artificial intelligence uh, entail? And maybe this could be a speculative uh, answer to the second mm. one. How do you think these configurations will affect the symptoms of those arriving at the psychoanalytic clinic, mm -hmm. which are usually entangled with sexuality. Mm -hmm. huh? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've come across, obviously I've come into contact with lots of people who are sort of invested in the, the whole sex robot industry and this um, fantasy of, of it being this emancipatory thing that we can suddenly everyone can have access to their, their absolute um, dream object and everything will be perfect. And now it's just so, of course, you know, most people would go, but that's absurd. You know, of, of course, what's, what, that, what that world is going to be dominated by is lots of male people who, um, you know, use these things for a very specific purpose and is going to replicate lots of very unpleasant um, things that already happen um, to uh, real humans in the in the world of um, sex work, so you know there's many arguments that are going on in that on the on sort of on the ground as it were about the political and cultural effects of 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 for example actual sex robots. I mean I think it's quite a limited um, scope at the moment because you know it's it's kind of quite circumscribed how that would, how the sorts of people who use it. And of course, you know, most of it is just basically, it's just capitalism. It's just people um, making lots of money out of lonely people or, you know, making lots of money out of basically Paris being parasitic upon the sex industry, which is already a fucking multi-million pound industry anyway. They don't, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not a new thing. Um, so the, the morality or, or otherwise of it is not really my uh, concern. I, I, I mean, yes. uh, but but the the question of um, the question of of sex in relation to um, fantasy and mm -hmm. and virtual and the question of um, intimacy. You know, this is a whole other realm which I think already. I mean, we already can see that. Uh, you know, sex, sex doesn't work. We know that that's what sex is. Sex is a, is a, is a non-relation. It's something that um, is a continual frustration for human beings. And, you know, all human beings can do is try and find some way, some symptomatic way of, 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 of um, answering this, uh, this problem, because actually sex is a problem. You know, it's, it's not a positive thing that we should all, you know, be using as a healthy thing. It's actually, uh, that's that came out wrong. <laughs> what I mean, is you know, philosophically speaking, sex is a problem in the sense that it's it's something that will always trouble the human. And um, mm. with artificial intelligence, I think that all that you're going to see at the moment, anyway, the way that we have it, is just different iterations of the way that those problems are addressed and different ways of trying to engage with uh, objects in um, a sort of sexual way. 
I mean, I think it gets more interesting when we talk about um, the question of um, the brain and the mm. way that artificial intelligence is being used um, in uh, sort of intraneuronally. And that in itself opens up a whole different kind of um, landscape of thinking about how humans in engage with each other. Um, again, Black Mirror is just a brilliant, you know, way of, of, of exploring these questions because it's so, um, there's so many uh, fascinating stories of the different ways in which humans um, find themselves trying to enact fantasies and then only ever encountering sort of horror because mm -hmm. you know the, the the human mind is such a terrifying place actually you know it's a terrifying place that with the the smallest bit of tinkering you can you can torture yourself you know you can find yourself in a in a, in a horrific situation just by you know anybody who's ever taken drugs knows that it might be fun for a little while but take too much or the wrong one and you can be trapped in a horrific world and and the same applies for thinking about well what 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 will ai do when it suddenly enters the the human being mm -hmm. so there's so many different aspects in which the body is implicated in the question of sex and um and that's yeah again like it's just such a enormously complex topic so what is the body of AI or what is the problem that arises when we try to think of an embodied AI? Yeah, it's just, um, it's very interesting because, um, well, the, 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 the way in which I particularly engage with the question of the body and the question of the suffering body um, in relation mm -hmm. to AI is, um, is via the film Ghost in the Shell, yes, um, which is a very interesting film about um, a, a, a person whose brain has been put inside a, a sort of cyborg body. Um, but I also look at that film in relation to um, Kant's, sorry, Lacan's paper, um, Kant of Exard, where he tries to think about the, the, the Kantian ethical imperative um, read through the Marquis de Sade. And um, the reason it's interesting uh, is because, well, the paper is interesting and it's a brilliant groundbreaking um, intervention in psychoanalytic ethics. Mm -hmm. But um, in relation to artificial intelligence, I find it interesting because it asks, um, it requires us to think about the question of um, following desire to its end or or indulging in jouissance to its end. And, mm -hmm. uh, for the Marquis de Sade, who wrote all of these um, very gruesome and graphic, but almost sort of comical um, stories about people trying to achieve the maximum uh, excitement and maximum sexual um, peak of of enjoyment, they they always they always end up being uh, disappointed because mm -hmm. they can never actually get to this point that they think they're going to get to because ultimately you either die or you're in too much pain or you pass out or whatever, you know? So these, these, um, these images of like orgiastic sessions with, you know, huge tum tumbling fountains of semen and, and it becomes so ridiculous, but, the, but, but in the book, it's sort of, sorry, in the, in Saad's writing, he's trying to, to think about um, almost sort of the mathematics of, of jouissance and so for for Lacan he finds this interesting because he's thinking about well what's going on here you know what 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 are the libertines Marquis de Sade's libertines trying to do they're trying to sort of reach beyond uh castration you know they're trying to find this this fantasized um world of pleasure or jouissance pain and pleasure um beyond castration beyond the cut you know the cut of the symbolic that we all live in because we're all in language we're all discursive creatures so this idea of um being able to to endlessly uh indulge is is very much um at the heart of the concept of the sex bot because yeah. you're thinking about a uh, you're thinking about the idea of a, a creature if an ultimately perfected creature that can not only um give you the illusion of of pleasure or pain but really can actually experience pleasure and pain to the nth degree because they can't die. Mm -hmm. 
So the fantasy of an undead creature, and you know, usually they're women in films, they're always women, aren't they, who get tortured and killed and raped and uh, you know, this fantasy is 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 a very significant one because it's it's something that if we're thinking about um the idea of replicating humans and replicating the human body or uh, uh, making ourselves immortal, what does that mean for the idea of pain and suffering and pleasure and pain and stuff? And all the, these things are t- bound up together because, you know, once you can make humans live forever, uh, uh, they can also suffer forever. And that's quite a big question when you're talking about um, uh, replicability. Um, so I find that really interesting. Yes, uh, I agree. This, it's, I think it's a really interesting movie. You're mentioning Ghost in a Shell. Uh, one might mention that it's also a, an anime film, mm. also a, a show, a series. Uh, there's always the question if you're going to watch an anime uh, dubbed or with the subtitles. The answer is with the subtitles, although <laughs> they speak really fast, so it's really hard to read. Uh, anyways, it's, 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 it segues me to another question, uh, which is very relevant to psychoanalysis, I think, because Freud, even in, in his last days or in the end of his career, he was very honest in saying that he was not able to truly fathom or incorporate uh, what is singular in feminine sexuality in his psychoanalysis. And like you said, uh, Ghost in a Shell is a terrific example. Uh, Female bodies are predominantly entangled in the creation of AI and in the science fiction of AI. It's always a a female body and a specific kind of of body as well. Uh, What can we what can we learn about uh, the feminine? Uh, from these portrayals or from this incorporation of the female body in the invention of AI? Mm. Um, yeah, brilliant question as well. Um, well, this this as well gets to the heart of why psychoanalysis is so interesting and important, particularly Lacan and psychoanalysis for thinking about um, artificial intelligence, because... Um, you know, I mentioned the question of this, the non-rapport, the sexual non-rapport. And for Lacan, you know, he he talks about this concept of jouissance and uh, the idea of, um, obviously, from Freud's libido and drive, Lacan does lots of many other things with this concept and comes about this the question of jouissance, which becomes central to his thinking. Um, but he also it goes through various... Um, modifications of the concept over over time and um he eventually arrives at this uh paradigm of the non-rapport in in seminar 20 in his later work and where he discerns uh broadly two um, modes of jouissance which he would call the phallic um jouissance and the other jouissance and one could say well the phallic jouissance is masculine jouissance and the other jouissance is feminine jouissance. Yes, but that doesn't necessarily mean that um, men only can have phallic and women can't have phallic because yes. uh, actually uh, anyone can have phallic jouissance. That's the question. But uh, only those sexuated, um, according to some people, uh, as a uh, sexuated as a female subject, Again, this has nothing to do with your anatomy or biology. Yes. But sexuated as a feminine subject can achieve both phallic and the other uh, jouissance. Mm-hmm. Now, um, what does that mean? Well, very simply, um, phallic jouissance uh, would be the idea of the constant um, attempt to achieve a specific object. And in this um, kind of cat and uh, mouse chase, you know, we can think very crudely of a man who looks at a pornographic image and it's a beautiful woman and looking at her breast and her bum and looking, wanting those things and trying to, chew, you know, get hold of them. Once they've got hold of them, that's that's it. You've, you've, you've achieved the, the phallic um, enjoyment. Of course, women do that as well. So we all do that. Uh, whatever the particular type of body or interest that you have in a sexual object. So it, it's not just a sort of typical um, conservative view of, of that. But but the question of other jouissance is really 
um, one quite um, more complex to do with the question of language. And what Lacan was trying to get at with talking about other jouissance is the idea that because we are um, bodies that speak, um, there is something about entering into language that uh, gives us access to a whole different um, realm of enjoyment that is not strictly related to this pursuit of a phallic um, object or this uh, sort of mathematizable one thing. And, you know, you can think of that in sexual terms, you can think of that in romantic terms, you could think of that as the idea of women, you know, having this idea of romance that is very, uh, you know, particularly thought about of, of women being the romantic creatures that want to imagine this um, transcendent relationship with a man. You know, so there's all these typical ways that you can imagine what 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 is meant by this. But it's also more abstract than that, because it's also to do with um, thought, and it's also to do with uh, the way that we try and imagine um, the structure of subjectivity. So um, the idea of feminine jouissance for me uh, in the book is something that takes on a really important um, uh, role because you see that there are so many ways in which when we're thinking about the question of AI that we see when the feminine jouissance is um, in, uh, invoked there is sort of this access to something beyond you know there's always this beyond and the beyond here it doesn't necessarily mean a transcendent beyond of something um otherworldly but it's just a question of escaping um a set escaping a closed set again coming back to the the sort of technical question of the the phallic and the feminine you know, the other way of looking at it is for um, masculine sexuality to be a man, you're, you're part of a closed set that is determined by um, an exception. An exception would be the, the non-castrated male, the Freudian totemic father who, is, who can enjoy uh, everyone, all the women, can have sex with all the women. And if you're a man, you're part of the group that is um, castrated because you can't enjoy all the women. And on the other side is the is the, the feminine sex, which is not part of a set. It's an open set in mathematical terms. Anything can join it. It's close. It's not, it can't be a closed infinity. Um, so yeah, so these, these concepts are really important when you're trying to think about the, the question, the binary, the normally binary question of masculine and feminine. But if you think of it as in terms of sets, open and closed sets, then you see how phallic and feminine jouissance operate all the time when we're talking about um, artificial intelligence. Mm. And at the moment, artificial intelligence is always thought about, I would say, from a very phallic um, perspective, not because just because it's about men making sex robots, but because it's about a very closed idea of what intelligence means in terms mm. of uh, achieving this one um, point. Yes, okay, extremely interesting. Um, yeah, beyond the portrayal on the one side, uh, on the one hand, the um, killing machine. We talked about Arnold Schwarzenegger mm. in, in Terminator and then the um, be beautiful, uh, sexy, seductive killing machine on the other side. Well, we're seeing here a, a masculine portrayal. Mm. Well, the, que the question of the subjectivity of, of AI remains, remains open, I guess. Yeah. We're reaching the end of our section. Uh, Shay, that's too bad for me. But let me try and, and uh, shove in one last question. You can answer it very quickly. It's just uh, me trying to get my own interest uh, maybe uh, associated with whatever you do. Uh, you know, my, my main uh, field of research is autism research. And um, it, when you read a lot of testimonies of autistic people, especially uh, the one by uh, Temple Grandin, she's a very famous uh, autistic uh, writer and, uh, and scholar. And she says that uh, she identifies herself as a computer. She thinks that she is in fact thinking like a computer, uh, calculating things like a computer and viewing the world, uh, speaking like a computer. Mm -hmm. uh, again, this can be completely speculative, but do you think that uh, the, the, the notion of an artificial intelligent subject has anything to do with any specific type of subjective structure? Um, I don't think it has anything to do with a specific type of subjective structure, mm. but I think you're 
exactly right about the question of um, autistic subjectivity in relation to um, uh, particularate systems and the question of um, the the ability and the capacity to to think computationally, for example, or the capacity to 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 um, uh, assimilate certain types of information in a very um, complex way mm -hmm. is an aspect of artificial intelligence that is uh, that, that, that lots of autistic subjects are um, very capable of and very talented at and have a, a huge ability, which is why, for example, in Silicon Valley, there's a, a big push to employ um, autistic people because mm. they have very, they're very talented um often in in certain um certain um activities that are related to to um building silicone chips and and um artificial intelligence programming and lots of very complex um processes which are certainly um really interesting in relation to how these uh forms of intelligence are encoded into um artificial intelligence mm -hmm. but that's not to say oh that's 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 really bad because artificial intelligence is something else no not at all i think that this is why it's such a fascinating topic because um it, it artificial intelligence is um a field which has grown out of certain endeavors um scientific endeavors of uh, which have a certain paradigmatic understanding of how the human mind works which is based on the analogy of the computer mm -hmm. and of course you know, for people who are very, for example, people who are brilliant at maths, you you would more easily see why the human brain in that case is is, is analogous to a computer because it seems that like they have common um, abilities. But actually, human uh, intelligence involves so many other different qualities that the, the AIs can't do, which is part of the whole paradox, you know, the Moravec paradox of artificial intelligence, which is that there are some things that you can that you can replicate in artificial intelligence that human beings can do sort of okay, but computers can do it amazingly, mm. but whilst at the same time, they can't do the most basic haptic um, questions to do with, you know, the senses and sensory bodily actions, which mm. are completely impossible at the moment for. So there's always these kind of like, different modes of understanding how um, intelligence is thought of in relation to subjective structure, which is really interesting as well, yeah. Yes, maybe this is uh, something else we can learn from uh, autistic subjects. Absolutely, yeah, definitely. We shall see. Um, so, thanks Isabel for um, uh, enduring uh, my, my questions and, and <laughs> sort of uh, presence at this point. <laughs> We're now gonna open up the discussion as we used to do here in the library talks.